Great. Okay, I think I'll start. So, uh, good evening and welcome, everyone. I'm Samir Savant. I'm the festival director of the London Handel Festival, and it's a great pleasure to see you all. Um, I, uh, uh, you're a mixture of people. You're friends and supporters of the festival, and thank you so much for your support. Or you're taking part in our Messiah reimagined on the fifth of April. Uh, as a singer in, in either our Sing at Home Chorus or one of our choral partners. And some of you are actually both, so it, it's great that you're here. Um, just some housekeeping. If you could stay on mute, um, because we are recording this um, so that it will be available on YouTube um, for people who have missed it. So if you could stay on mute uh, during uh, the speaking. Um, but it would be really lovely to hear who you are and where you're from. So if uh, you could just type that into the chat function and just say hi to everyone. I know that we have people from the States, from Canada, from Germany, from Sweden and from all across the United Kingdom here and a really lovely international crowd you are and you're all very, very welcome indeed. But please do introduce yourself in the chat uh, as uh, Lorna and Lisa just have done. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the uh, the event, it's going to run for around an hour. Our lovely speakers will speak for around 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and it's best if you just do the questions through the chat and then I can kind of chair that with our speakers. And I'm really, really thrilled to have two um, experts on Handel's philanthropy. Uh, Catherine Hogg um, is probably known to many of you. She is the curator of the Gerald Cook collection at the Foundling Museum. And obviously Handel had this very long association, philanthropic association with the Foundling. And it's particularly relevant, obviously, because he put on his Messiah concerts there. So we can imagine when we're singing Messiah that uh, Handel's philanthropic spirit fills us as well. And we're joined also by Lizzie Buckle, who is a PhD student from uh, Royal Holloway, who has a, a kind of quite provocative um, set of views to put forward to us. Um, uh, which I'm really interested to hear more, more about. Um, so yes, um, please do stay on mute and please think about your questions. And for now, I will hand over to Catherine. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. I hope that's working. Is that really? Um, so good evening, everybody, and thank you, Samir, for inviting us. Um, I'm going to talk a fairly straight talk about Handle the Philanthropist, um, and then Lizzie will respond. So I'll just talk for about 15 minutes. Um, Handel, you all, you all know, but as a musician and as a composer, but he was also an entrepreneur, and he weathered per periods of financial difficulty in his professional life, as well as sharing the benefits of his success. He worked for many different patrons, including the Royal Household, as well as running his own opera productions and concert series and collaborating in various business ventures. But Handel favoured two charities in particular in his life, the Fund for Decayed Musicians, that wonderful title, now the Royal Society of Musicians, and the Foundling Hospital, which both benefited from his charitable activities and from bequests in his will. Handel's relationship with the Foundling Hospital and the Fund for the Support of Decayed Musicians developed in the last two decades of his life when he was enjoying prosperity after a period of financial uncertainty. He had been investing in the hazardous field of opera production, risking capital to hire a theatre, performers and the staff to perform his newly composed operas and hoping for good returns in the ticket sales. But as the popularity of Italian opera waned, he moved towards opera production which had lower investment costs and became hugely popular among the emerging middle classes of the 18th century. It was an age of philanthropy with the construction of many hospitals and other charitable institutions. And Handel was among many artists, lawyers, doctors and other professionals who gave their expertise as well as their money to support those in need. So this is the founding hospital in the 18th century. If you haven't been to it, um, you, it doesn't, it's not there anymore, um, but the Founding Museum is just to the left of the picture. Um, you can't see it in, in this picture. It's now to the left and the gates right at the front are still evident in Guildford Street. If you ever do come to London, do come and see it. The colonnades around the entrance courtyard are also still there, part of a children's hospital, a children's playground today. 
So benefit concerts were a popular form of fundraising in the 18th century. And in 1749, 10 years before his death, Handel approached the founding hospital, which had already been open for 10 years, to offer a benefit concert. This was to fund the completion of the building of the chapel, which is the, in the middle of this picture. Handel may have learned of the need for funds to complete the chapel from his publisher, John Walsh, who had already become a governor at the hospital. At this point, the building was complete, but there were no windows and furnishings, so it just needed a little bit more money. So the minutes of 1749, which you may be able to read, but I'll read them out to you just in case. Uh, Mr. Handel being present and having generously and charitably offered a performance of vocal and instrumental music to be held at this hospital, and that the money arising therefrom should be applied to the finishing the chapel of the hospital. Resolved that the thanks of this committee be returned to Mr. Handel for his gen generous and charitable off offer. Ordered that the said performance be in the chapel on Wednesday the 24th instant at 11 in the forenoon. This was only three weeks after he had uh, offered the, the, uh, the concert. Handel composed the Foundling Hospital Anthem, especially for the occasion. It opens with the lines, blessed are those that consider the poor and needy. And it continues with lines such as, they deliver the poor that crieth, the fatherless and him that hath none to help him. And the charitable, charitable shall be had in everlasting remembrance. These lines from Psalm 41 and from the book of Job in the Bible were doubtless chosen to inspire the audience to make generous contributions to the collection for the hospital at the end of each concert. The anthem borrows music from various earlier works, including the Oratorio Susanna and the anthem for the funeral of Queen Caroline, and it ends with the Hallelujah Chorus from Messiah, which would hardly have been known to London audiences at that time. As you will know, Handel regularly borrowed or recycled and refreshed his music for later works. If he had a good idea, he had saw no reason not to use it more than once. This is the chapel where the first performance, his first concert took place. Here it's a later illustration and the windows are, and the furnishings are complete, but it was, would have been a bit more bare for the first performance, which took place three weeks after the meeting as agreed. It attracted a full house and raised over 350 pounds. The concert included the newly composed music for the Royal Fireworks, which had been a huge success, um, very popular um, oversubscribed rehearsals, which you probably know about from elsewhere. But this performance was attended by the Prince and Princess of Wales, which therefore brought all the nobility and gentry. After the concert, Handel declined an invitation to become hospital governor, preferring to serve the charity in his way. And when the governors requested another concert the following year, he decided to perform Messiah for the hospital's benefit. He'd given the first performance of Messiah in Dublin in 1742, seven years earlier, at a charitable concert. The Falklands Faulkner's Dub Dublin Journal announced the performance was for the relief of prisoners in the several jails and for the support of Mercer's Hospital and of the ch charitable infirmary. Here is a part of the anthem. Sorry, my slides seem to come back to front at that point. You can see the text right at the bottom, blessed is he, consider the poor. Coming back to Messiah, here's the Dublin programme. And this is one of the six copies that survive of the uh, very first programme of the very first performance of Messiah. Um, so although it hadn't been designed particularly for a charitable performance, Han when Handel gave his first performance, it was actually for the charities, the jails and the hospital and the infirmary. And although it was a success in Dublin, it wasn't well received when he brought it back to London. The audiences debated whether such a sacred subject should be performed in a theatre, which was more commonly associated with secular themes. And of course, there were no concert halls as we know them at this time. So the Messiah had received only a handful of performances in the eight years since the Dublin concert. But the performance of Messiah at the founding hospital in the chapel for a charitable purpose resolved the difficulty and the audience's consciences. The concert was oversubscribed and the hospital minute books record that a second performance was hastily arranged a fortnight later to accommodate those who had been turned away. The hospital had printed far more tickets than the chapel could hold and sold them at the door as well as in advance, thus creating um, a slight crisis among the, the audience members. In a codicil to Handel's will, which he wrote in 1757, two years before he died, Handel gave a fair copy of the score and all the parts of my oratorio called the Messiah to the Foundling Hospital. It's highlighted here. This provision of a set of performing parts was a good part, good thinking on Handel's part, because it meant the concerts could carry on over after his death. 
Messiah was never actually published in Handel's lifetime in any form. After his death, the parts were duly copied out and 1,054 pages of music were delivered to the hospital only three weeks after his death. And we have them on display along with the will in the Foundling Museum. This is a small highlight of that will page so you can perhaps read. I give a fair copy of the score and all the parts of my oratorio to the Foundling Hospital and the date, which was August uh, 1757. Handel also paid for the first organ for the hospital chapel and remained in close contact advising the governors on the concert for the formal opening of the chapel and approving the appointment of the first organist. The score which is here is the score which was copied at his request so he, Handel never actually touched this copy this was copied after his death by John Christopher Smith the first organist who was also his uh, general manager and assistant. I've got the Hallelujah Chorus page here just to show you. We don't think he actually these scores are actually used by the hospital because they're all in such good condition. They were probably a master set, which were then copied again for use in performance. Um, any of you who are singers will know, or performers of any kind will know that you soon scuff the pages, write your uh, rehearsal marks on and so on. So um, they wouldn't be quite as pristine as they are today. But Handel carried on doing the benefit concerts for the last 10 years of his life, raising almost 7,000 pounds for the charity which can equate to about 17 million in terms of today's income while, and established Messiah, of course, as a central work in the English repertoire. The other charity favoured by Handel was the Fund for the Support of Decayed Musicians. In 1738, three musicians working at the King's Theatre in the Haymarket were inspired to create a fund to help musicians and their families in distress and advertised a meeting for subscribers to a fund for the support of decayed musicians or their families. A year later, 228 musicians, including Handel, put their names to the Declaration of Trust. And here's a copy of it. Well, this, is the, uh, this is the actual official declaration, courtesy of the Royal Society of Musicians. It's in their archives and Handel's name is there in the box. These 228 musicians put their names to the declaration and paid an annual subscription. But with no safety net of a welfare state, illness, the loss of a finger or even teeth could leave a professional musician destitute in the 18th century and London had a large population of musicians from home and abroad. The nobility and gentry gave support and the fund eventually got royal approval and became what is now the Royal Society of Musicians. In, in, funds were invested to provide income and now it no longer needs to have subscriptions. Of course this year in particular we've seen the need for such a fund to support musicians during the coronavirus crisis and the, the same fund has been very generous in supporting them. Handel gave his first benefit concert for the society at the King's Theatre in 1739, hiring both the theatre and giving his direction of the performance free of charge. He chose the oratorio Alexander's Feast, composed two years earlier, which had just been published in score. The audience was described as numerous and polite, and although tickets were given out at no charge, many people made donations for the charity. Handel appeared at several further concerts for the Society, and the contemporary writer Charles Burney actually wrote, Handel was seldom absent from the benefit for decayed musicians. And in the last codicil to his will, written a few days before his death in 1759, Handel bequeathed a thousand pounds to the Society, and you can see it just here, I give to the governors or, tr or trustees of the Society for the support of decayed musicians and their families, one thousand pounds to be disposed of in the most beneficial matter, manner for the objects of the charity. This was a huge donation which was unmatched for about a hundred years. A performance of Handel's Messiah then continued almost every year after Handel's death from 1760 until 1914. In 1784, the first of several Handel commemoration festivals took place in London and proceeds from the performances were advertised as for the benefit of the Society of Musicians. These large scale concerts attracted an audience of four and a half thousand and raised 6,000 pounds for the Society and a thousand pounds for the, Westminster, the new Westminster Hospital. And these concerts began a tradition of Handel festivals and inspired music festivals across the country where provincial cities were building their own hospitals funded by charitable giving. You can see the scale of the operation here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these are the performers. Um, this organ was, is actually 
at the West End, it was on its way to Canterbury Cathedral and they stopped and built it um, in the Abbey just for the festival and then took it all down again afterwards and took it down to Canterbury. <coughs> But it was the talked about event and it was uh, described across Europe. It was such a large scale performance. And the inspiration then was to all, for all the provincial cities to copy. And here we can see a few examples. <coughs> Excuse me. So while Handel's music is his greatest bequest in itself, his philanthropic work in donating performances for the needy causes established this sort of legacy and tradition, particularly of Messiah, which is performed at almost every uh, major music festival in the 19th and early 20th century and continues to this day. The performances of Handel's music were particularly associated also with benefit concerts for the sons of the clergy and for hospitals and infirmaries. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1834, the Handel commemoration in Westminster Abbey was revived and funds were shared between various musical charities. The provincial choral festivals, which established in the 19th century, were also very much associated with charity and the Messiah. And here's an example. This ticket at the top is for a performance of Messiah, <coughs> excuse me, at the Birmingham Music Festival in 1814. Here on the left, we have the performance for the for the hospital, which is just after Handel died in 1759. And in the middle, we've got the Yorkshire Grand Musical Festival to support York County Hospital and the infirmaries of Leeds, Hull and Sheffield. <coughs> Excuse me. And then here on the right, the Royal Society of Musicians and another Messiah. Excuse me, my voice has given up just as I finish. So Handel's two great philanthropic legacies were his music and its association with charity. I'm going to pass over to Lizzie now, and I'm just putting a little link into our ask any particular questions at the end of the day, um, which don't that Samia doesn't have time to cover, or any other questions about Handel, Messiah, and philanthropy. There's our email address, and now I'll pass over to Lizzie. Okay, so as uh, Catherine has just demonstrated, Handel is frequently hailed as the philanthropist. And to a certain extent, rightly so, but maybe Handel wasn't quite as golden hearted as we might at first think. Maybe we could interpret his actions in, in maybe a slightly different way. Um, and so with the magic of punctuation, I've given my talk um, a rather more cynical title, um, Handel the Philanthropist. So it's often noted that Handel was governor at the family hospital and he paid for the first organ in the chapel there. He also composed the anthem and assisted with the annual performances of Messiah, um, which Catherine just mentioned. Uh, he also left money in, in his will. Um, again, as Catherine um, pointed out um, in her talk just now. But um, this list of good deeds looks slightly less um, shiny uh, if you look at them in, in some more detail. Um, so firstly, um, while the Messiah received a warm reception at its premiere in Dublin, it wasn't particularly successful in London until it was performed at the founding, music, uh, founding hospital. So you can see why he wanted to maintain his connection to the institution by organising regular performances because he saw that it was making him more successful. So it would make sense for him to continue to um, uh, be connected to this um, institution. Um, and you can see uh, his the advertisements for the, for the um, uh, performances of Messiah at the founding um, hospital also sort of suggest reasons why they might have been, it might have been advantageous to handle to uh, be connected to the founding hospital. So, um, you can see here, um, so at the top, uh, the hospital for the maintenance and education of exposed and deserted young children. That's just the fancy name for um, the founding hospital. Um, and so the first few lines read, at the request of several persons of distinction, George Frederick Handel Esquire has been applied to for a repetition of the performance of the sacred oratorio called Messiah, which he having very charitably agreed to. And so this was the um, performance that Catherine mentioned just now that um, where they ran out of tickets, uh, ran out of space in the chapel um, at the founding 
hospital. So they had to do another one um, because there were lots of people with uh, tickets who didn't get in and were probably a bit cross. And if you look at uh, the, the, the language that's used here, um, it's really very favorable for, for Handel. Um, for instance, uh, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but the, the phrase very charitably, I mean, he didn't just agree to it, but he, he did so very charitably, you know, uh, uh, exaggerating or certainly emphasizing his um, philanthropic actions. Um, and similarly, um, it wasn't just at the request of any old person, you know, it was several persons of distinction, which gives Handel power because um, people presumably of some kind of lofty station are um, asking him to do something for him. He's in a position of power. And also just his name is very prominent. It's in capital letters. Uh, so it's very, very clear for the uh, person reading the newspaper that you know, he is involved. Um, and so drawing attention to his involvement in, in the event would have, of course have attack, attracted more people to come because of his, you know, his celebrity status. Um, but you have to think about how good the, the advertisement made him look and the emphasis on his involvement must have benefited his reputation um, in the way that it uh, publicized his generosity and demonstrated how successful he was. Um, another example, so um, I think Catherine mentioned this one as well, but um, despite the many benefits that um, Handel received through his connection to the founding hospital, his allegiance only seemed to stretch so far. Um, he initially turned down the honour of being made governor to the hospital, preferring instead to serve the charity in his own way, whatever that means. Um, but he relented only after the governors tried again and let him off the 50 pound gift that they were um, that new governors were expected to give when they were elected to to charity which suggests that he was sort of trying to wriggle out of giving that um, and later on um, maybe because he'd agreed to become a, a governor or maybe because he continued with these um, performances um, the annual performances of messiah but um Later on, the, the governors mistook this um, for an agreement um, to the, to, that Handel would grant the hospital sole performing rights of Messiah. And they formed an application to Parliament to make it official. And when he found out about it, Handel apparently flew up into a rage and exclaimed, Oh, what shall the foundlings put my oratorio in the Parliament? The Teufel, my music shall not go in the Parliament which in case you couldn't tell from my um, terrible German accent was the um, 18th century transcription of, of Handel's uh, presumably strong ac accent. Um, and basically means, um, um, why would the foundlings put my oratorio um, to parliament? The devil, my music shall not go before the parliament. So he was clearly very unimpressed by that. So presumably he had still he still intended on performing Messiah elsewhere to, to make the most of the popularity it had agreed thanks uh, to its connection with the founding hospital. And so these things when taken together, I mean, even if you uh, include the fact that he reused a lot of the, the material uh, for, the, for the anthem that he composed for it, it sort of implies that maybe he wasn't quite as golden hearted as uh, some people have made him out to be. But before you all start booing and boot me out of the Zoom call, um, maybe we just need to put it into, into some context, into some 18th century context. So firstly, we need to have a think about um, 18th century attitudes to charity, um, which differed quite a lot probably from our own today. Um, as I think Catherine mentioned that charities were relatively a relatively new phenomenon in the 18th century. And, philanthropic activity became a bit of a craze. There, were, there was a flurry of new activities um, founded, uh, charities, sorry, founded, including the London Lock Hospital for treatment of venereal disease, the Magdalen Hospital for the reception of penitent prostitutes, and of course, the Founding Hospital for the education and maintenance of exposed and deserted young children. And this uh, effusion of charitable activity 
has led some historians to dub the 18th century the age of benevolence. And uh, lots of contemporaries seem to have shared this attitude and, and thought themselves to be uh, incredibly philanthropic. So um, here is Henry Fielding, who is a, a novelist, uh, and he proudly declared in 1752 that charity is in fact the very characteristic of this nation at this time. I believe we may challenge the whole world to parallel the examples which we have late given of this sensible, this noble, this Christian virtue. But things weren't necessarily as rosy as, as this uh, statement might seem. And to understand why, we need to think about where this new spirit of humanitarianism came from. So before the 18th century, there was an understanding that there would always be poor people. That was just how things worked. Um, there wasn't anything anybody could do about it, but it was just a fact of life. If you were poor, you were poor, and that was more or less it. Um, but then, um, by around 1700, attitudes started to change, and it was understood that poverty resulted from unemployment. And since unemployment was related to changing economic conditions rather than just the way things were, um, poverty was seen as something that could be overcome by social action. So we could, people could do something about it to sort it out. And so charities established in the mid 18th century to aid the sick or orphans, pregnant women, reformed prostitutes, that sort of thing, um, were intended to increase the numbers of useful laborers and reduce the numbers of so-called accidentally poor. And so in doing so, they, they thought the nation would um, would become wealthier. And of course, then the individual thought they too would become wealthier. Um, with when um, later on in the century, when um, with the sort of development of um, more machines, um, um, there was, there was this more of an emphasis on the moral uprightness of the laborer rather than their economic output, because the machines were now um, doing more of the work than they were. And so um, later on in the century, um, charities were considered a way to educate the poor on religious and moral duties, um, encourage sobriety and industry, independence, so they could pass on these um, values to, to future generations and would generally improve the um, moral out, outlook of the country. So charity was seen as a way of improving not only the, you know, what you've got in your pocket, but also um, how, I suppose, well, how pleasant, how good the country was. Um, and charity was also considered a way of counteracting luxury. Um, in the 18th century, luxury was considered a sign of excessive indulgence or a lack of self-discipline, wantonness, idleness, effeminacy, and it was even associated with being French, which was pretty well as bad as it got. And women were seen as particularly susceptible uh, to indulgence. So uh, conduct writer Thomas Gisborne claimed that an unguarded fondness for ornament has been known in a multitude of examples to overpower the native tenderness of the female mind. And here he is telling his wife, who's clearly hanging on, on every word, and his dog seems quite interested, but maybe he's got a treat in his hand or something, you never know. So um, philanthrop philanthrop philanthropy wasn't necessarily driven purely by altruism. Um, some people thought charity would in improve the status of the nation and uh, improve what they had in their pocket. Others thought it would make them look more fashionable, less indulgent, uh, more English, and if they were um, a man, more masculine. But either way, um, people uh, generally didn't want recipients of charity to thrive too much uh, in case they might jeopardize uh, the order of society. So uh, for example, a plan to set up a music school for children at the founding hospital was supposedly rejected by governors because music was an art of luxury. These children were to be trained up to useful purposes with a singleness that would ward off all ambition for what was higher. 
and teach them to repay the benefit of their support by cheerful labour. To stimulate them to superior views might mar the religious object of the charity, which was to nullify all disposition to pride, vice or voluptuousness. So in other words, the poor could become more moral, hardworking and sober, but they shouldn't be allowed to harbour ambitions beyond their station, or they'd risk becoming self-important, vain and immoral. So while some charity recipients undoubtedly benefited um, from, from the charitable institutions that, um, that they were hosted by, looked after by, whatever, um, these institutions weren't necessarily quite as um, inclusive and um, I suppose positive as you might have expected. Um, another port important part of um, context that we need to consider is the fact that Handel wasn't the only person benefiting um, from uh, involvement in charities in the 18th century and by no means the, the only musician. Um, lots of musicians benefited from their involvement in, in benefit concerts in particular. And um, these, these musicians seem to have, seem to have seen how uh, charity could, could benefit their, their own careers. Um, so, for example, this is a payment list um, from the 1760 performance of Messiah. Um, and we, we know that in general, members of the orchestra and chorus were paid about the same amount um, as they earned from, from theatre work. Um, you can see on the top, um, at the top there, that Mr. Miller, who's a bassoonist, the lead bassoonist, in fact, um, earned half a guinea, which is 10 shillings and sixpence. So that's kind of equivalent to five days labour for a skilled tradesman. Uh, unfortunately, things were still looking pretty bad for viola players and not much has changed there. And so they only got um, eight shillings. You can see Mr. Rash there um, only got eight shillings. Um, and as you might have expected, the, um, the soloists earned uh, much more than members of the orchestra so, uh, and of the, of the chorus. So, for example, um, you can see that Julia Frazi, uh, so Signorina Frazi, um, received six guineas, six pounds and six shillings, which is 12 times the amount that Mr. Miller, the bassoonist, um, got. And you can see also from John Beard's entry that some, some of the star performers at benefit concerts donated their fee to charity, so he didn't receive anything for um, this particular performance. And um, this was relatively normal. Um, quite often, a few of the uh, the soloists would, would donate their fee and quite often also the, the leader, which must have saved the charity uh, huge sums of money because they are the people that tend to earn the most. Um, but those performers who did donate their money might not have done so purely out of the goodness of their own heart as they had loads to gain from flaunting their generosity. Um, as with Handel, um, Give some examples before newspaper advertisements regularly drew attention to star performers generous deeds. Uh, so uh, these are adverts from slightly later performances of um, Messiah at the Family Hospital, so um, 1769 and 1774. And so the 1769 one here states that Signor Giardini has generously offered for the benefit of this charity to pay the first violin and a concerto. And the one on the right says, Miss Davies, Mrs. Wright and Mr. Norris and Mr. Reinhold have for the benefit of this charity generously engaged to sing the principal parts. And again, the language generously engaged, benefit of the charity, etc., really emphasizes uh, the musician's uh, so-called apparent altruism. But some of the performances, uh, performers uh, listed here managed to appear considerably more charitable than they really were. So uh, despite what the advertisement declared, Thomas Norris actually received 10 guineas for his performance um, at the Foundling Hospital in this year. And he received 10 guineas the following year as well in 1775. And he was also the only soloist to claim a fee on both of those occasions. His fee was quite generous um, 
as as it went for um compared to for example um you know non non benefit concerts uh, and it was actually the second highest fee awarded to any performer at the founding um at the founding hospital and um, so it really was quite a substantial amount of money performers at other charity concerts were also thanked publicly in newspapers this one is for a performance of Ruth, uh, also an oratorio by Giardini, who we saw a little bit from in the previous slide. Um, and it was at the Locke Hospital in 1773. And it says here that thanks of this court be given to the two Miss Lindleys, Signora Galli, Messieurs Giardini, Vernon, Champney, or possibly Champness, I'm actually never sure which way you say that, Arnold, Dupuis, and Crosdale for their performance gratis. And it goes on to say that Mr. Lindley's generosity in returning the sum paid to him by the governors of the Locke Hospital for his daughter's singing cannot be made too public. And Thomas Lindley did indeed return his two daughters fees for singing at the Locke Hospital, but this was only after he demanded that the Locke Hospital pay the same amount as the Foundling Hospital had paid them that year, which worked out as 20 pounds um, per daughter, so £40 uh, in total. Um, in fact, the, the founding hospital had paid him a total of £100 uh, that year for uh, himself, because he played, he, he led the orchestra, uh, and his son, uh, also called Thomas, confusingly, who also played the violin and his two daughters sang, so they got £20 each, so £100 in all. Um, and so £20 is is the highest amount that they uh, any performer had received and is nearly double what Mr Norris got, which we've already said is actually quite a lot of money. Um, and maybe to contextualise it, I, I looked up how much uh, £100 was worth in uh, 1770 compared to today. So in 2017, that would have been £8,725.53p, according to the National Archives, um, which could buy you 14 horses, um, 21 cows, and I think most shockingly to me, it was the equivalent of a thousand days labour for a skilled tradesman, which is um, quite hard to get your head around. So it was really a lot of money. And so, uh, Mr. Mr. Lindley only gave back the money that the Locke Hospital um, um, had paid to him, so the £40 for his two daughters, um, after uh, Miss, uh, Mr. William Romfield, who was uh, one of the governors at the Locke Hospital, paid him a visit and presumably twisted his arm a bit, and Lindley offered to return his fee. And when he did receive it, the governors promptly made him perpetual governor for his generous donation, uh, although I would say it was somewhat reluctant. Um, but to the average person reading the paper, Mr. Lindley looked amazing. In fact, um, but in fact, he was uh, you know, a less than enthusiastic, enthusiastic philanthropist. So participating in charity concerts would allow musicians, including Handel, to showcase both their musical skills and their good conduct, both um, at the performance itself and also in the newspapers. While donating to um, charity might go unnoticed, participation in such an event enabled them to perform their benevolence before an audience of many witnesses, who could then further transmit news of their generosity by chatting to their neighbours or, I don't know, telling their best friends, that sort of thing, writing to people. Um, Public engagement with um, charity could also um, help to offset the performer's connections with um, the excess and commercialism of theatre, which deals with the problems connected to luxury I mentioned before. A luxury was associated with extravagance and luxury and um, uh, things like that. So being associated with the theatre wasn't necessarily a good thing, whereas if you're performing in a chapel connected to charity, um, it sort of helps to offset that and paint you in a better light. Um, benefit concerts could help performers and composers to um, sort of construct their persona um, in a way that would seal their popularity and maintain their career. So it's perhaps unsurprising that Handel and the other musicians chose to associate themselves publicly with these events. 
So how do Handel's actions fit with the mindsets of other musicians? Uh, how do, sorry, how do Handel's actions fit with the mindsets of, of the other musicians and the attitudes towards charity in the 18th century that we just explored? Well, by using his connections to charity to promote his career, um, he was in effect improving the economic situation of the country in two ways. Firstly, by providing money and support, um, he provided money and support to the two institutions, so the Foundling Hospital and the Fund for um, Decayed Musicians. Um, and in doing so, he would help the children and, music and, and musicians um, to find a way out of poverty so they could become useful, moral, industrious workers and help increase the, we the wealth of the nation. And secondly, he ensured that his own career didn't suffer in the process. So by refusing to hand over the rights of Messiah, he could prevent uh, he could prevent himself and all those who depended on him. So I don't know, his family and the people that worked for him and the people with their businesses that linked to him, like, I don't know, printers who might print his music, that kind of stuff. Um, it, would, it would prevent them from becoming accidentally poor because it would keep all these businesses and these people going. So um, Handel, in a way, was, was looking after the wealth of the nation, which was sort of what poverty was, uh, the, the solution to poverty was aiming at. And so based on what we know about charity now, maybe I can remove the punctuation from my title to become Handel the philanthropist. But we also know that Handel was a shrewd businessman and he made um, many sound financial investments throughout his life and even managed to avoid the collapse of the South Sea bubble that caught out many of his contemporaries. So perhaps we should interpret his philanthropic actions as part of a savvy financial decision. Um, perhaps he saw his involvement in charity as a safe investment in his future uh, and you know, in his celebrity persona and in the future of the nation, which you know, it seems like quite a win-win situation for all, um, help out, um, you know, those in need, as we would say today, and also um, help out himself, it made sense. Um, so maybe I need a slightly more radical uh, approach to my title, maybe it should be handle the businessman, but let's not forget the other musicians we just discussed, um, whose actions were actually probably more scandalous than um, those of Handel. I think we often forget that these musicians were basically um, self-employed workers with no pensions, no sick pay, no benefits from the government if they um, found themselves out of work. They, they had to be basically excellent businessmen. They, were, um, they had to network to secure their future jobs and butter up um, you know, potential patrons and keep the current patrons happy. And it was vital that they kept their finger on the pulse to ensure that they could continue to draw a crowd and maintain their success. Um, so if they could harness the new craze for philanthropy to their own ends to, to, to help um, at least temporarily um, sort out their careers, then why wouldn't they? So with that in mind, perhaps I should have just called my talk Handle the Musician, but I think I will leave that up to you. That's the end. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lizzie, uh, and to Catherine as well. That's really fascinating insight into the lives of 18th century musicians such as Handel and, and you know, all, the, all these kind of complex issues that they, they faced. Um, I'd uh, love to uh, uh, get some questions going in the chat, so please do post your questions there. But the first question I've got, um, while you're all thinking of your questions, is, is to both of you. And, and Lizzie, you showed us this image of Handel wearing the, the cap and looking like Bob Geldof. And, you know, we kind of say that those concerts at the Foundling, those fundraising uh, concerts where the, 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 the first iteration of a kind of live aid scenario. And um, you could draw an analogy between Mr. Handel and Bob Geldof in that Bob Geldof, when he started Live Aid, was, you know, his, his 
singing career had effectively ended. Um, and, you know, there was this terrible famine going on in Ethiopia and Bob Geldof reacted to that. But it's a similar thing, isn't it? That he he was looking to kind of have something to do to be back in the public eye, to be adored again in a way that Handel was. So we've got a kind of a modern day example, haven't we? Is that one of your reasons for kind of positioning, um, you know, the, the link between Handel and Bob Geldof in that way? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, I think um, there are an awful lot of similarities between, um, I, I know I just said, oh yeah, well, we think of charity as something completely different now to how we, we formed it in the 18th century, but I actually think it's a lot more similar than um, than you might expect. I think quite often we sort of expect something back from when we give to charity. We sort of, you know, you put your pound in the thing and then you, you suddenly feel you know all warm and fuzzy and aren't I a great person? And I think you know, that is the case for everybody, not just for Bob Geldof, but there are certainly uh, examples of, of prominent uh, celebrities like, like Bob Geldof who have definitely helped an awful lot of people. They've raised a crazy amount of money, but you can't deny that they've probably partly driven, uh, certainly at the start, by the benefits that it would have to their, their career. And there's a really funny, um, I think it was um, from, um, uh, what's it called? Comic, Comic Relief a few years ago, and it's Ricky Gervais, it's on YouTube, you should watch it. And he's uh, doing one of these films where, um, you know, a celebrity goes to Africa and they and they talk to somebody who says how hard their life is and then they say, right, you need to ring this month, this number and donate to charity, etc. And um, he's kind of making fun of this and it turns out that actually it's just a green screen and the person he's talking to is an actor and um, he's actually doing it, you know, for product placement and all these other celebrities come along and say, oh, can I get involved? I've got a new product out. Can I? And they're all kind of clustered around this, this actor pretending to be a, a, you know, an African orphan or something like that. And I actually think that's just a really good example of, of what it might be a little bit like today and probably what it was like then, because we probably haven't changed that much. We're still humans after all. And, and Catherine, your view on this and that, you know, as Lizzie says, we're, nothing's really changed. But with Handel, there was something slightly different, isn't there? Because he had quite a kind of thorough Protestant upbringing. And we feel, you know, I know that there is an understanding that some of his philanthropy came, came from his childhood and the example he was set by the people that uh, looked after his education and stuff. Yeah, in, in Halle, in his hometown, there was already a... a um, the Frankshire Fa um, Institute, which was a, a f essentially a foundling hospital. So he would have been very familiar with the concept. And of course, they had a lot more foundling hospitals in, in Europe way before we had any in this country. So he would have been much more familiar with the concept, probably from Italy as well. Um, and, and I think actually, if you're uh, a man like he is, who doesn't have immediate dependents, as in immediate family, and you've got a lot of money, you know, you, you might well be thinking, well, what would I, what should I be using it for? And the people he would have spent time with were other musicians. So the fund for decayed musicians would be an obvious choice. And we don't actually know why he first approached the hospital particularly, except that um, his publisher, John Walsh, was a governor there. And he might have just thought, well, actually, yeah, he might have thought this is this is a good place to try out the Messiah because it's not doing very well. What we don't know is, is why the first performance of Messiah in Dublin was for charity. We don't there's no uh, documentation, as far as I know, of saying why those charities were picked, whether he picked them, whether they approached him or whether the person who hosted in the, in the music hall in Fishamble Street, you know, had already fixed up that it was going to be a charity concert for these um, and then got Handel in to do it. We don't, we don't have any records, as far as I know, that, of that, uh, of how that first started. But but um, I think perhaps having done that first performance for a hospital and the, the debtor's jail, you know, he, he was perhaps inspired to think this is quite a good way of using it. And it is, as, as Lizzie was saying, get, gets the Messiah out there and gets it established. Yes, and I mean, we've all got to be grateful for that. I mean, every single person on this call, because, you know, if Messiah hadn't succeeded um, eventually in London, we, we wouldn't really have, um, you know, it might have. Um, become a, an obscure work and we might not be performing it today. Um, so I've got um, a couple of questions here. We've got Lisa asking, uh, Handel left a fair use of the score of Messiah for Fandling Hospital to, to continue these fundraising concerts after his death. 
Um, and would this have been in perpetuity until the, the hospital's demise? I mean, how 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 far in advance, you know, into the future did these concepts? Yeah, yeah, I think this is the um, partly how we got the dispute that Lizzie mentioned about the 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 hospital thinking it had exclusive use, and it was they actually left a fair copy of the Messiah, which was just meant a nice, neat, copied out score and parts that they could carry on using. Um, and they could just use those because because there was no other way of getting the music if you think of it not being published at all which is quite incredible to us today it, you just couldn't get hold of a copy so you wouldn't be able to do a performance if you didn't actually have a manuscript copy and a lot more music circulated in manuscript at that time than, than printed and, and so there were no printed parts available so essentially he was giving them uh, the hospital the ability to use it really until the parts fell apart or they lost them or, or or they could make copies from them which is what we think they did but um but there was no sort of copyright there was no concept of copyright or performing right or anything in those days so um so it was really just literally providing the music just as now a lot of music is higher only you know you have to pay the publisher it's, it's the same principle if you didn't have if you don't have the music you can't play it so uh, i think that was how handle was it was probably expecting that you know, to last a few a few decades after his life. Is he, so? An example, um, sort of maybe comparable for the Locke Hospital, where um, Giardini, um, who I talked about very briefly, um, he he left um, his oratorio to the Locke Hospital, and they make a big show of putting it in a special box that um, with four locks to make sure that nobody could take it away from them because like like Catherine says um, you know if you lost it you, that's it you can't get another one um, and so I suppose that sort of illustrates it that um, you know it wasn't you couldn't just print off another copy so it was quite valuable. And Jeremy makes an interesting point here is saying that you know whereas Handel's approach in his own lifetime is is similar to other musicians and there is some self-interest involved. He said it can't be said the same about leaving stuff in his will because he wasn't around to have the kind of the accolades and, and that shows some evidence for his charitable feelings. Um, and, that, and that kind of leads me to another question was, you know, what, what do you think Mr. Handel would have thought about these commemoration concerts in Westminster Abbey? I mean, presumably he would have been very pleased, but really quite humbled as well, I, I'd like to think. Catherine, what, what do you think? Yeah, yes, I, th I think I think so. I think probably he, in a way, he probably would have been surprised at how much it had snowballed. But uh, I think actually he would have been quite shocked at the scale of the performance compared with the scale of performance that he was used to on a, on a musical level. You know, he just would have never have heard any of his music or imagined it to be performed on such a large scale with such large crowds because that just didn't happen in his lifetime. But um, but from the philanthropic point of view, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he. He would have been very pleased, and and the idea that that his uh, uh, and perhaps surprised at the scale of, of philanthropy and you know, the scale of bequest that you really could uh, have created create you know in, in this in that which in a way that one just didn't do in his lifetime. And 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 yeah, <laughs> Jerry makes a joke here. Um, there's no London Jardine Festival, of course there isn't. So because you know, Handel's music has lasted the test of time. And I, and, and, and more than other, you know, even great composers like Purcell, well, there wasn't a big anniversary for Purcell, you know, a, a few years after his death in the same way. Um, yeah, I think the, because the London, the first commemoration was really instigated by the Society of Musician, Decayed Musicians. Of course, Handel had been their champion. They still had this thousand pound bequest, which was huge you know, for its time. Um, so I expect, I'm sure they were thinking, well, let's let's milk this as it were. Let's keep this association going. You know, let's let's get bigger and better. It was it was an obvious foundation stone to build on. Um, from the end, of course, Handel was by far the towering sort of giant of his lifetime in, in musical terms. and. Uh, and also affluence terms compared with other musicians of the day. Mm, indeed. Until, is, yeah, sorry, Lizzie. Go I was going to say, but I mean, certainly earlier on in, in Handel's career, there's, um, you know, Purcell isn't forgotten about because, well, we've had a lot of problem in this country of, of having English composers that, that, that people like. There aren't very many of them, so people tend to hang on to them as much as they can. And there's, there's, um, a record of um, it's a German musician coming to London and and somebody's giving him advice on on how to put on a benefit concert and how to attract lots of people and one of the bits of advice is to you know praise Purcell as much as you possibly can and they'll all love you and um, and so you know certainly in Handel's lifetime I would say Purcell was still like a relatively prominent figure but but like Catherine said um, you know 
uh, his connections uh, to the to the Royal Society of Musicians um, probably boosted his legacy, which might be why we kind of talk about him today um, more often than than Purcell. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and, and, and I suppose this is the, the final point as well. Um, uh, Melissa talks about the, the buying the tickets in a, in a chocolate shop on Fleet Street, and that's the kind of equivalent of Eventbrite or Zoom, you know, booking your tickets for Zoom now. But I, I'm um, intrigued, Catherine, that they basically made a complete mess of the ticketing. I mean, to, to have sold so many tickets and then to have to turn so many people away. Is, is it because a lot of people just didn't, they, they, like the aristocratic patrons would kind of reserve the tickets and pay for them, but then just not show up because they got a better offer? Or, I think why? so, and I suspect also they, they farmed a lot out not knowing how many would be sold and they didn't have a system of, of keeping track of how many had been sold. So they, they would, I mean, they printed 1500 tickets. Well, they weren't going to fit that many people in the chapel ever. So, you know, they, but perhaps they just thought it was better to, to just flood the market and, and get, get a return. And then of course, Handel very graciously came and did a second performance two weeks later to, to get the others. But even the following year, I think they printed 1200 tickets, which was still pushing it, you know, and even, you know, as with any event, event right or anything else, you know, you, you don't get a full house. Not not every ticket holder turns up normally, but um, um, I think uh, yeah, I think they were just being a little greedy to start with, perhaps, and uh, and and it it did settle down after the years. They they uh, managed to print a more sensible number. I just quite fancy having to go to a chocolate shop to get a ticket. I think that sounds much more fun than going online, doesn't it? So. Yes, indeed, or or a coffee house and getting your latte on the side. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we've run out of time, but I, I'm, it's been such a fascinating evening and thank you both so much, Catherine and Lizzie, for your wonderful insights. And, and thank you all uh, for coming along um, this evening. Uh, if I may ask you now to, uh, to just leave um, gracefully, uh, so we don't just shut the meeting down. And, uh, and please just, if you want to make some comments in the chat, we We'll, we'll, for some final comments for the speakers that would be wonderful otherwise um, we've got another one uh, we've got several of these events coming up on Wednesdays until Masai reimagined on the 5th of April so you will get email notifications about that thank you very much good night